Hello and welcome to Gospel on the Go with Rachel. My name is Rachel Parker and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the Anglican priest for the churches of St. Thomas in, in Wainwright and St. Mary's in Edgerton within the Diocese of Edmonton, the Anglican Church of Canada. And we are located in the southeastern quarter of the province of Alberta. I'm glad to have you here with me today. Just to let you know ahead of time that this Gospel on the Go um, will be the last one until our Thanksgiving. In Canada, we have Thanksgiving early in October. So I will be away for the next two Sundays on some holiday time, going to a wedding for my sister-in-law in Ontario. And I will be back though for Sunday, October 9th for Gospel on the Go for Thanksgiving. And that will also be the kickoff of our new parish, our new ministry, Day Spring Ministries, in which we will welcome um, St. Mary, St. Saviors in Vermilion into our, our congregations. Um, so we will have a new group of people worshiping with us from different locations, so to speak, and a whole new way of being called Day Spring Ministries. So when I get back from holidays, it will be a brand new day for all of us. So I hope that you'll join us. Today, I'd like to share with you the gospel of the day from, chap from the 16th chapter of Luke, as well as some prayers and the sermon and uh, a blessing. So we will begin with the collect or the prayer for the day for this particular Sunday in September. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and ourselves in your image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and to serve you with reverence and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And this is a reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, um, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that the man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you to the true riches? And if you do have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In a moment, I have to pick up my sermon. Sorry about that. Now I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As with most gospel readings that have anything to do with money or stewardship, this is another one which is awkward and difficult to grapple with. Today we have heard a story, a parable, about a shrewd businessman, a man who was found wanting by his boss and went out and basically cooked the books to make himself look better and to buy himself friends for the day when he was, that was coming when he'd be out on his butt. He dreamed and he schemed, and he decided, and he did. 
None of what he dreamed or schemed or decided or did was right, but he is still apparently praised in the end. Why? Why would Jesus give this finagler an easy time of it? Why would Jesus, who normally stood for forthrightness, honesty, and integrity, let this man walk when he had done clearly so much wrong? That's a tough thing to consider, and it doesn't seem to make much sense when we compare this parable to all the other ones. It could even be tempting to think that Jesus was suggesting that we should do anything to help people come to believe in the kingdom of God. If unbelievers don't like the requirements for Christianity in heaven, then we could just cut them a better deal, one that might feel more comfortable with, right? Wrong. When it comes to Christianity, there are no shortcuts. We can't buy our way in, we can't sweet talk our way in, and we certainly can't fake our way in. So what does this parable have to tell us? It is quite possible that the most important part of this parable is what is not said. Jesus does not conclude the parable with a commentary on what the man did wrong. He leaves that for us to discern, as we most certainly will, if we too are truly working on the pathway to getting into to understanding real Christianity. The parable ends with these words, and his master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. Let's look carefully here. His dishonesty was not praised. His cheating was not commended. This was no compliment for a job well done. The master was not delighted to be bilked out of his rightful profits. But the steward was surely clever, energetic, and decisively responsible in managing the crisis of his own future. That's what caught the attention of the owner and caused him to applaud his servant. Jesus ends the story right there and turns to the disciples to drive the point home to them. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. As enthusiastic and ingenious as was the crooked man in this parable toward his own self-interest, so we as followers of Christ can be enthusiastic and energetic in our own lives as children of God. We are called to throw ourselves into what we believe with all of our energy and use all of our intellect and thoughts as well. We too are to be shrewd. All people who think ahead have opinions. Some have strong opinions about many things. Others have strong opinions about few things. But it seems that everyone has an opinion about money. How we should make it. What we should do with it. When we should hoard it. And when we should give it away. Today's gospel says a lot about money. It tells us about a manager who squandered someone else's money and then used that same currency to make friends and influence people. But today's gospel says as much about Christian stewardship as it does about money itself. And a great part of stewardship is our attitude. When we talk about being good stewards of our time, our gifts and our money, do we automatically think of adjectives and adver adverbs like enthusiastic and energetic? Or do we use words like jealous and worrisome? In the parable we heard about a man who wasn't dis who was dishonest who was dishonest with his master's money. He didn't trust his master with respect, and that was evidenced in his dishonesty. But do we do the same thing? As we allow the gifts that God has shared with us, including our homes, our finances, the people we love, to flow in and out of our lives, would Jesus be able to look at our habits and recognize that we are enthusiastic and energetic in our stewardship? Or would he see us as jealous and worrisome? We don't have to look too far to think or, or think too hard to recognize how Jesus would consider us. The way that we share our resources with those around us says a lot about the way we share our Christianity with those around us. Earlier I mentioned that the shrewd businessman dreamed, schemed, decided, and did something to ensure that he would have a comfortable retirement, even if it was a forced retirement. 
While we are not called to be dishonest or underhanded in our lives as Christians, we can use those four things to help us live a good life as Christian stewards. God made us human beings with a great capacity to dream. In fact, we are even told in Ephesians that God can do more in us than we could ask or imagine. That's a big scope to work with. We are called to dream. To dream of a world in which all people can live in peace. To dream of a world where no child goes to bed hungry or without a blanket. To dream of a world in which loving our neighbor as ourselves is easy because we know what it is to truly love ourselves as Christ loves us. We are also encouraged to scheme. Now, quite often the word scheme gets a bad rap because it seems to apply that we're going to go and do something on the wrong side of right. But scheming can be a good thing. When we plan a surprise birthday party, we are scheming. When a man proposes to his girlfriend, he schemes. When we search for ways to share our Christianity and our love from God with other people, we are scheming to show them the beauty of a life lived in Christ. And that's a pretty good scheme. We are also called to decisions and action. We can dream of ways to make our church attractive and welcoming to people, and we can scheme to ensure that we create ministries for outreach that present a good witness to those who ask us what we believe about life and faith and life after death. But if we dream and scheme without making a decision and taking a course of action to put those dreams and schemes into place, we are floating face down in the water before we ever start. The dishonest businessman went the long way around, ensuring he had, that he had a good retirement. Had he dreamed, schemed, decided, and done the right things in the first place, he wouldn't have, had to, he wouldn't have ended up in such a predicament. Had he worked as he was supposed to, been honest with his boss and the people he did business with, he would have been all right. We wouldn't be struggling to understand him or Jesus' consideration of him today. If we work within the guidelines that God has set out for us with respect to right Christian living, giving back to God of the gifts he so willingly shares with us, and taking a good look at our own Christian lives, habits, and attitudes, we will be led to new ways of living. God himself will show us how to dream scheme, decide, and do with his blessing, with his divine help. And when we have God's help, there isn't anything we can't do. From making our church welcoming, to offering outreach to our community, to leading the world back to peace, love, and understanding. We just must remember to ask God to help us imagine the dream, to create the scheme, to decide what to do, and then just do it. Imagine what Jesus would have to say about our community of Day Spring Ministries then. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as our congregations of St. Thomas and St. Mary's and St. Saviors walk this lot la these last steps before our coming together in Day Spring Ministries. We ask that you would guide us, that you would help us to dream the possibilities that you are envisioning for our corner of the world. The things that you are asking us to do, the new ideas and ways we will be invited to reach out to our neighbors, to the homeless, the, the houseless, to those who are lost and need to be found. We pray that you will help us to create the scheme the work, the plans, the ways that we will come together to know one another, to work together as one real parish, one group of people who just happen to worship in three different places. That the scheme that you have in place will not only serve our three congregations, but will bring hope and peace and possibility to all the people who live in our, in our communities. We pray that you will help us to make good decisions that you will help us to know what it is to serve you in these communities, to know how we are going to be called to move forward and to move beyond who we have been to become who we will be. 
and we ask your courage and your push and your drive that we will do, that we will put into place the dream, the scheme and the decisions that we make, that we will truly become the presence of Christ in this part of Alberta, this area, this triangle of communities that are, that are in need of the presence of your Holy Spirit, the healing and the salvation and forgiveness of your Son, the recognition of your presence as Creator. Help all of us in each of our congregations and all those who will join us in one way, shape, or form to learn how to, under your wisdom and your vision, to dream and scheme and decide and do. May we be shrewd Christians that together we might serve you as you are calling us to serve. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. And now we will take some time for the prayers. I invite you to, um, to take some time to offer up prayers for those people that you would like to pray for. If you wish, you are welcome to put in the comments on after the video um, names of people you would like me to pray for. I pray every day. Um, or you can email at rev.rachelparker at gmail.com. Rachel Parker is spelled the way it is on the YouTube channel. Um, and just let me know because I will pray for those folks that you that you ask prayers for or for yourself. So we will pray um, to the source of all love and life saying, we pray to you and responding, Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray for all who call themselves Christians, that we may become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to the praise of Christ Jesus, our Savior. We remember this day our prayer partners of Church in the Nativity, Frog Lake First Nation, and the parish of Bagombo in the Bouye Diocese in Burundi. For members of our own cycle of prayer, David and Susan Hockett, Lano Tondu, Jean, Jean Ward, and Ted and Diane Wilkinson, we pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Stephen, our bishop, and for all and other ministers, that they may remain faithful to their calling and rightly proclaim the word of truth, remembering Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Gregory, our metropolitan, Igreja Episcopal Anglicana do Brasil, and the Pro Provincial Synod of the Ecclesiastical Province of British Columbia and Yukon. For the Dean, Council, and Congregations of the Southern Interior Region of the British Columbia Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the repose of the soul of Elizabeth, our late Queen, and for King Charles III, for the leaders of the nations and all in authority, that your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives. We pray for all members of our Canadian Armed Forces, for all stationed at CFB Wainwright, for Padres Rob, Tony, Eduardo, Eduardo Baloum, Boghas, and Dan. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our towns and those who live in them, Wainwright, Edgerton, Vermilion, and Frog Lake, the poor and the rich, the elderly and the young men and women, that you will show your goodwill to all. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the ministries of the Council of the North in the Diocese of Athabasca, for the Diocese of Algoma, the Most Reverend Anne Germond, Archbishop, Metropolitan of the Ecclesiastical Province of Ontario, for hospital chaplaincy, remembering Regular Brandel, Chaplain and Coordinator of Hospital Visitors in Edmonton, Lee Bazanson and Kevin Craiglin, Chaplains, all hospital visitors throughout the diocese, for the Buyenzi Parish in Bouye Papias Masengesho Rector, and for Paul First Nation, we pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the victims of our society and those who minister to them, that you will be their help and defense. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those preparing for baptism, that we they may be strengthened in the faith. We pray to you. Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who have favor, found favor in your sight from earliest times, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and those whose names are known to you alone. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful witnesses. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. And now as our Savior 
Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to share with you a blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and all those whom you love and pray for on this beautiful day and forevermore. Amen. As we wrap up this time of Gospel on the Go, I pray that you will have a blessed week. I will be around tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday for Church at Home with Rachel. And then starting Thursday the 22nd through the 2nd of October, I will be off. But I will be back and hopefully fully energized and ready to go. So I look forward to seeing you again for Gospel on the Go as we celebrate Thanksgiving here in Canada on our, our Thanksgiving is on the Monday, but our Sunday celebration of Thanksgiving on the, the 9th of October. God bless you and may you have a blessed couple of weeks.